So a child who's neglected and abused, they look at life kind of, we call it egocentrically. And so if I'm being neglected, it must be because I did something wrong. I must be a bad person. If you conclude that I'm a terrible person, I'm a zero, I have zero value. Well, who wants to live with that realization? That's pretty painful. What many do is they try to compensate for that. So I need to prove that I'm better than everybody to prove that I'm okay. So I'll be the best in sports, the smartest in school, I'll be super competitive, I'll have lots of money, I'll get a good job, or I will create this fantasy world where I'm going to save the world. I'm going to be the hero in every story. When life has been chaos and unmet needs and a lot of bad stuff happening, it's easy because you have no role models that are healthy. You don't have any normal that's healthy. You just have a normal that's quite unhealthy. It's very hard to figure out what a healthy normal looks like. And it's very easy to have unrealistic expectations about what a healthy normal should be. And so what happens for a lot of people coming out of complex trauma is they have all kinds of unrealistic expectations about life. And they set themselves up actually to fail. Is there, is there a way that we can distinguish if something um, from our past it was traumatic or not? Because I feel like, you know, it can be almost like a buzzword, uh, right. trauma, right? And so is there a way that we can determine if something is actually traumatic or not, or if there is maybe something else besides trauma? I think it's really important to make a distinction up front, and that is the difference between a traumatic event and trauma. So we all have traumatic events. That's just anything that's hurtful that we're too small or we don't have the tools or the ability to resolve, to handle, to keep safe. Um, so what happens in a traumatic event for a child is they run to the brain releases oxytocin, which makes them want to run to mom and dad to protect them. Um, and if mom and dad protect them, then the traumatic event doesn't become trauma because they're kept safe, they're nurtured, it's resolved. But if they run to mom and dad and they're not kept safe, then it becomes trauma. It becomes an internal psychological injury because they can't resolve it. They can't get safe. Does that make sense? Yes. And I feel like there's, you know, there's, like you said, there's those one-off moments, traumatic moments, and then there's maybe prolonged events, maybe like a five to like seven year period of a little mm -hmm. neglect or abuse. Yes. Can you, can you talk about the, diff, um, I believe it's called simple versus complex. Can you talk about the difference between those two? Yeah. So simple is one time event. Complex is ongoing or continual danger. But I think you're also alluding to another thing that's really important to identify. So we refer to it as big T trauma and little t trauma. And big T trauma is your horrific events um, that something bad happens to you where you're hurt badly and that's what most of us think of as trauma and so it's easy to think yeah a child can't handle um, being raped sexually abused etc and so that traumatic event traumatizes them internally but there's a second type which is called little t trauma which most canadians and, and americans 75 percent at least have and that's neglect and that's where something good that should have happened to you like nurture comfort didn't happen to you um so it, it's almost an invisible trauma you should have got it but you didn't and so the child feels in danger they feel all alone why is my need not being met why is somebody not caring for me right now when I'm emotionally hurting. And so it has the same effect on the brain. It's a traumatic event, but it doesn't seem like anything bad. And that's where a lot of people go, well, little T trauma, that means it is little. It doesn't, it didn't affect them. And I go, no, little T is neglect, but it's just as profound in its effect on people. And so we know that over most of the people in Western society have little t trauma, um, but we only talk about big t trauma, and and little t trauma typically becomes ongoing. It's complex. It's it's not once where you're not accepted. It's not once where you're not nurtured. It's not once where you're not um, accept uh, uh, connected to. It it happens every day, and the child can't fix it, can't resolve it. 
So the child concludes it must be something wrong with me. It must be my fault. And they begin to go to fight, flight, or freeze. They, they don't know what to do, but they also begin to believe I'm a bad person because nobody wants to connect with me. Nobody wants to meet my needs. Nobody is comforting me. So they develop this core belief that something's wrong with me that's very negative. Is it safe to say, and correct me if I'm wrong, so it's um, for stuff like complex trauma, it's not just the events or like the things that's happening. Can can the traumatic part also um, be the emotions surrounding that? So maybe let's say the anxiety of going home from school, the, the sadness of after um, maybe a parent's fight. Is that the safe to say is that the, the emotions surrounding the trauma are, are as not as traumatic, but play a factor in the trauma as well? Yes. So I would say two things with that. So complex trauma basically is like abuse or neglect, but it's basically they have a need that's not being met that they can't resolve on their own. So it's an unresolved unmet need, but that then means it's an unresolved negative emotion. So now they have pain. Now they have hurt. Now they have anxiety. Now they have depression, anger, but nobody's helping them resolve it. Nobody's helping them regulate it because the people that are to be their co-regulators, mom and dad, are either absent, dysregulated, angry, etc. So they have no way of resolving all of these negative emotions, and that becomes traumatic for them because who wants to live with constant negative emotions? That's no way to live. So they start to shut down and dissociate. The second piece to me that's so significant is we often think of trauma in terms of the external visible environment. Um, but what a child comes in with this fine-tuned radar to mom and dad's emotional state. And if dad's always angry, well, dad's not safe. I can't connect to dad. Dad's a scary person. Um, and so they're picking up how safe is the emotional state of mom and dad? Because if it's not safe, then I'm not safe. And so again, I can't resolve mom and dad's emotions. Therefore, I can't resolve my emotions. So I feel all alone. I feel in danger. And it's a scary world. Now, uh, something else you talk about is the difference between the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system. And what you just talked about sounds like um, being stuck in that sympathetic nervous system. And you, I've heard you talk about something so fascinating about how depression is almost your parasympathetic nervous system forcing you to relax and reset. Can you just speak on that a little bit? Sure. So our sympathetic nervous system, parasympathetic, are both parts of our autonomic nervous systems. They're the balancing part. So the sympathetic is the work energy part. And then the parasympathetic is our rest healing part. And we need both to be in balance to be healthy. Um, but what happens when we're in danger, so we have fear or stress, is we go into our sympathetic because I need to be on high performance to get through this. This I got to survive this. This is scary. And so we're in our sympathetic. So a child in complex trauma where they're feeling in danger all the time, is constantly in their sympathetic nervous system. They always have to be on guard because they're walking on eggshells. The other shoe's about to drop if they're not on guard. And so they're never able to relax. They're never able to go into the parasympathetic. And so what begins to happen is their central nervous system is saying, hey, I'm getting tired. I'm burning out because I'm always in energy mode. I'm never in rest mode. And so the, the brain provides cortisol, adrenaline to give them extra fuel, and that helps for a while. But then they're burning out more, so that's where some people can go to drugs that give them extra energy. But eventually, <clears throat> the brain is committed to our survival, and it says, if you're not going to shut down and let me rest and heal, I will do it myself. And so the brain will bring about depression as a way to shut a person down so it can finally go to the parasympathetic nervous system and rest. So that, to me, is such an important piece. Can I add an, a second piece to this, Brian? Yes. Okay. Yep. So what's really important to understand complex trauma is that the initial response to danger is fight or flight, which is your sympathetic nervous system. And so the brain releases cortisol, which gets the adrenaline gland going. So that gives you the extra 
turbocharge energy to fight or flight. Um, but what happens if a child is too little to fight or they're too little to run away? They have to stay there. So the brain goes, okay, cortisol, fight or flight's not working. What are we going to do now to survive? So the brain actually gives up on the sympathetic nervous system and it says we're going to go instead of 100% sympathetic, we're going to go 100% parasympathetic. And we're going to release opioids into the bloodstream, natural opioids that will shut the system down. So we're going to go to freeze and we're going to dissociate. So we can't find safety in an external world by running, by fighting. So we're going to find safety by retreating into an internal world of dissociation. So we're going to kind of go out of body experience, we're going to go to fantasy land, we're going to go to distractions, but we're not going to be able to be present in the present. We're going to have to somehow dissociate from the present. And so opioids becomes kind of the second choice of the brain when it comes to survival. But it, it's it's common in complex trauma because children complex trauma often happens when children are little. They're too little to fight or flight. And so cortisol doesn't work, so they have to go to opioids. And that's where for some, once they find like cutting, cutting releases opioids into the body and all of a sudden they feel better because they can relax. It shuts them down. It, it takes away the pain. It doesn't add to pain. Um, and then they find opioid drugs and they find think they found the per perfect solution. But then if I can add one more piece to this, what happens to a child who's in freeze dissociation is they still need their parents to somehow meet their needs because they're too little to meet their own needs. So then they go to fawn, and that is, I'll be a people pleaser. I'll be a chameleon. I'll be whatever you need me to be. Just don't be mad at me. Just please take care of my physical needs, even though you're not going to take care of my emotional needs. And so that's fawning becomes kind of a blend of opioids in the blood plus using a bit of cortisol to survive and give you energy, but you're just performing to survive and you're burning out. Now, this concept of creating a fantasy world, what, what is that? What can that look like? Because I can almost relate to that a little bit when I was a kid is, well, every child, they kind of create fantasy worlds. But are you saying for um, ch children who went through complex trauma, it's even more almost um, and they yeah. can dissociate from the real world um, even more than people who haven't? Yeah, so dissociation is really on a spectrum, but fantasy is actually designed to be a wonderful, good, creative part of a child's life. It's an act of imagination. Um, but what can happen in complex trauma is I have to create a safe internal fantasy world where I'm loved, where my needs are met, where everybody takes care of me. And so a child who's being sexually abused, they can go into a fantasy world where they're on a beach in the Bahamas, where they're sitting on the ceiling watching as if it's happening to somebody else. They can go total out of body like they're not even there. Others can totally split off and go to kind of a split personality, multiple personalities, because it's too painful for that part of them to be in the present, so they just split that part off. Um, so that's the extreme end of dissociation. The mild end of dissociation is a person who shuts down their emotions and they just go to an, they're always in their head. They're just analytical. They're, they're academic about everything. They just don't feel or they need constant distractions. They're constantly busy, constantly working, so they don't have to think or feel. So those are all subtle forms of dissociation. Um, and, and some of them have a fantasy life of what life should be like. If only I had this, if I had this, they're always finding happiness in the next accomplishment, but they can't find it in the present. In this fantasy land or this fantasy world, is this where almost extremely high expectations can come from? Because I feel like everyone can, I mean, everyone can relate to this where in that fantasy world, like you're like, the best person ever, you're the hero of the story, you're going to save everyone. And that's that can be unrealistic. And that right. can almost make you have very negative feelings if you don't reach those very high expectations that you create for yourself in this fantasy world, right? Very much. So uh, if I can tie it back to what we said at the beginning. So a child who's neglected and abused, they 
look at life kind of, we call it egocentrically, through their eyes that everything affects them is because of them. Um, and so if I'm being neglected, it must be because I did something wrong. I must be a bad person. I must be unlovable. I must not have valuable value. Uh, if I'm being abused, I must be a terrible person. If I was abandoned, that must mean I'm a zero. So everything's a statement about me and my value and my worth. Well, it, if you conclude that I'm a terrible person, I'm a zero, I have zero value, well, who wants to live with that realization? That's pretty painful. So we, what many do is they try to compensate for that. So I need to prove that I'm better than everybody to prove that I'm okay. So I'll be the best in sports, the smartest in school. I'll be super competitive. I'll have lots of money. I'll get a good job. Um, so I'll get status, power, all of those things. Or I will create this fantasy world where I'm going to save the world. I'm going to be the hero in every story. But it's, it's, so what comes out of complex trauma is this core belief of shame that I'm the problem. I'm not good enough. I'm a failure, which we then try to compensate for. And fantasy worlds enable us to compensate in one way uh, to be the hero. Mm-hmm. And now, what, what you, when you said there about um, we, we have a very egocentric view of it, um, I feel like that's subconscious though, right? We don't really like think to oh, ourselves no. as a kid, like I'm a, I'm worthless. I'm like, I'm not good enough. It's almost like, it's almost subconscious in a way, right? Like we don't really consciously yes. think that. Yeah. No, all of, so this, this important thing to recognize about complex trauma is it usually happens to a child right from in- infancy, even when they're in the womb, because they're picking up their mom's emotional state. Um, and so we call it, much of complex trauma is pre-verbal. A child can't put it into words. A child can't even understand it. Um, and so it happens all at a subconscious level in the brain where it just goes into that survival mode. Um, and so a child then is responding and adapting. So a child's needs aren't going to be met, so it adapts and goes, well, if I'm this way, maybe my needs will get met. Or if I do this, maybe I won't get hurt. So they're constantly adapting. But again, that's all subconscious. It's not like they're sitting down with a pen and paper saying, what would I, what should I do here to, to solve this problem? It's just adapt, adapt, adapt. And, and often those adaptations seem to work because it, take some of the pain away. They don't get hurt as much. Um, some of their needs seem to get met. But what happens when they get to adult life is what they thought was working is no longer working. It's now a maladaptation. Um, so they didn't trust anybody. They lied in order to stay safe. They manipulated in order to stay safe. Now they get to adult life and try to have a relationship and they lie. They don't trust. They manipulate. Maladaptation doesn't work anymore. Um, and so that's what begins to happen. But by that, so the key to me is this complex trauma, preverbal, subconscious brain, maladaptations, but we think they're good adaptations. It takes 20 to 40 years before life smacks us enough in the face that we realize, wow, that's a maladaptation. So that's a, a quite a delayed negative consequence that comes out of all of this subconscious programming in the brain. Uh, And so then to start to change that, it's like, whoa, you got to really concentrate hard and work hard to change that subconscious programming that's been there since I've been two years old. Now, what about, what about this? And uh, I may or may not be talking from experience. I feel (laughs) like people can, people can fight so hard for that attention and approval but at the same time, be staying in the background, staying quiet. What is, what is that? Do you, know, do you understand yeah. what I'm saying here? Yeah. So when we talk about adaptations, that a child, so a child's needs aren't being met or they're getting hurt. So they adapt. So some children go to, I'm going to be a hero. I'm going to meet everybody's needs. I'm going to take care of everybody. I'm going to be this, get good grades. I'm going to do all the chores, be super responsible. And all of a sudden, they're the family hero. Everybody loves them and and talks good about them. And they go, wow, that's wonderful. But then they get to adult life, and they're just full of resentment because everybody uses them, and they got to work, 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 work. They never relax. If they relax, they feel guilty or selfish. So the hero is one adaptation that 
gets validated in our culture, but it burns people out. But some children, they go to, I'm going to become invisible. I won't have any needs. I would never want to be noticed because if I'm never noticed, if I never put myself out there, if I'm invisible, then nobody's going to hurt me. Nobody's going to make demands on me where I'm going to fail. Um, nobody's going to make fun of me. And so they try to become invisible and we call it the lost child. And again, that seems to work. And they spend a lot of time isolating. They spend a lot of time amusing themselves. Um, they're great at developing skills that they can do solo and activities that they can do solo. But when they get to adult life, there's just an emptiness and loneliness that settles in that that is quite consuming for them. Um, and then it's really hard for them to stand up for themselves, to put their needs out there, to treat themselves as an equal in relationships when they've always tried to be invisible. Part of being invisible also was they avoided they avoided confrontation. They avoided anything that was difficult. That any they avoided social settings. Avoid, avoid, avoid. And now they get to adult life and they find avoiding is not working anymore. And and so, but to actually confront stuff is scary. Because I don't like angry people. I don't like confrontation. I don't like all of these other things. So again, all of these adaptations from childhood often become roles that a child develops that seem to work, but in adult life, they end up messing up. So there's a couple other roles that we refer to. So one is what we call the jester or the comedian. So it's the child that just learns to be funny all the time. So let's keep everybody laughing. Let's be the life of the party. Let's uh, let's be a great storyteller. Then everybody will like me. Nobody will get angry. It'll be fun, fun, fun. They get to adult life and they don't know how to be serious. They can't go deep. They don't know how to talk vulnerably. They just feel they have to perform all the time to keep everybody laughing. And then the fourth role is the child that just goes, you know what? I'm not going to adopt a role. This family is hurting me, and I'm going to complain. This family is not loving and meeting my needs, and I'm going to let everybody know about it. And that child becomes known as the problem child. Because the parents, they look at the hero, the comedian, the invisible child, and they go, aren't we good parents? Look at how wonderful our children are. This one child, he just is a problem. If we didn't have this child, we'd have a perfect family. Meanwhile, this is the only child who's being honest. He's the only child who's being emotionally, intellectually honest, but he's being branded. And so then he becomes the scapegoat. Any problems in the family? Yeah, that kid, he's the problem. He's the one that caused dad to get angry again. He's the one that causes mom to be so depressed, etc. So that scapegoat or problem child is what some children do, and then they often get kind of hardened in that, and they think now they have to prove that they're never going to submit to any authority. They're always going to find fault with everything, and they just rebel, rebel, rebel. That becomes their identity. Can you give some examples on what complex trauma can look like? Um, because I feel like some specific examples of maybe what, what complex trauma could look like could be helpful to some people. Yeah, so for many, like the obvious one is a child that has abuse in any form. So physical abuse, verbal abuse, emotional abuse, um, sexual abuse. So that, that that's there. But then there there's the uh, emotional needs that aren't met. So a child who tries to attach to mom and dad because they need to connect in order to get their needs met in order to survive. And so they try to attach to mom and dad, but dad's too busy. He's working all the time. Mom's depressed all the time, mental health issues. And so they can never connect. So that's a scary thing for a child to not be able to connect. Or a child who is authentic. They just show their personality. They're the way they are, and they just are who they are. But then they get criticized for it. They get punished. You're too sensitive. You 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 show too much emotion. You, you cry too much. All of those things, now they're punished for being who they are. So they begin to go, authenticity, that needs not being met. It's now being punished. The need to connect, that's not being met. I feel all alone. Then they have this 
all their little quirks about themselves, funny nose, big ears. Um, they're a bit uncoordinated. They're a bit ditzy. And they're not being accepted for that. They're being laughed at, teased. Um, names, they're being called names. Now, all of a sudden, it's not safe to be themselves because they're always being picked on, laughed at. So those are things. Then you get parents who are perfectionists. So if you come home with straight A's except for one B, straight A's and one B is not good enough. It's what's wrong with you? What, how come you got a B? What, you're an embarrassment. Um, and, and then all of a sudden it's like, wow, unless I'm perfect, I'm not good enough. And so the bar gets set way too high and they always feel like they're failing. Um, so those are just some of the common things. Another one that happens for a lot of kids would be comparison. Um, so why can't you be like your brother? Your cousin is so much better than you. Wish you were like your cousin. And all of a sudden it's like, it's again, not safe to be me. It's not good to be me. Um, and so their world all of a sudden becomes quite dangerous for being picked on, punished, laughed at, criticized, all of that. Yeah, I feel like there's, yes, there's stuff in the home, but then there's also can be stuff with friends and school. Yes. And like you said, like that teasing and like picking out these, these small things. What can affect, what effect does that have when, um, when it's coming from our peers rather than our, our family? Yeah, so what, when we teach complex trauma, we say most complex trauma takes place within the family unit, primarily with mom and dad, but it can go even with within the family unit to siblings. You got a sibling that's always picking on you, making fun of you, sexually abusing you, and mom don't do any mom or dad doesn't do anything about it. So it can be from siblings. Then then we go to the community. So you go to school and you got a bully there. You got a teacher that doesn't like you. And so they're always putting you down, giving you bad grades. The the bully's always picking on you at recess and nobody's doing anything about it. So that becomes the next thing. But then you've got cu cultural things. So you're a black kid in a white neighborhood. You're always being picked on. You're a poor kid in a fairly wealthy neighborhood. And you're always feeling less than not good enough. You can't participate in things. You, you're a Muslim kid in a very Christian neighborhood. And all of a sudden you're weird and you're picked on. So there's all kinds of different cultural things with that can then create the sense that this is not a safe place for me to be. So racism, um, sexism, patriarchy stuff, so it's not safe to be a woman as you get older, all of those different things. So then you go beyond that to kind of international stuff. Um, there's a war. There, there's unrest going on. There's climate change going on, all kinds of things where it, it's not so safe. So complex trauma lack of safety can be created through all kinds of different levels, different means, but the main one is the family. I also feel like kids, um, they don't really, so I feel like I'm, I'm thinking about maybe an experience I had where a kid like in like fourth grade called me fat and I convinced myself I was fat. I was not fat. Yes. And I look Sorry. at pictures of me from now at that time period, that was not the case. And it's, but yeah. like, it's, it's funny how, as a kid, like you can process that as truth when it's just some kid just teasing you over, just trying to be funny, right? Yeah. And so what I would say to that, Brian, would be this. Um, when, when that was said to you, I would suspect that either kids, other kids were listening and heard it. Yes. And, and some might have snickered, some might have said something. So it wasn't just that the person said something. It, there was some type of validation that you perceive going on which added to this must be the truth um, because others are agreeing with it so what we know about children is when we come into the world we don't know who we are we're we're asking am i lovable am i what do i look like and so we we get pictures of ourself by looking at mirrors. So we get a picture of our body by looking at a mirror, but we get a picture of our internal character personality by mirrors of friends and family who, if they neglect me, they're saying what I'm like. If they hurt me, they say what I like. If they laugh at me, they're saying. So 
I'm constantly getting reflections back to me and I'm super impressionable because I don't have any opinions. Uh, it's being shaped by others. And, and so what happens is children naturally put more weight in what some people say than in others. So we put tons of weight in what mom and dad says, tons of weight in what people we respect say, not much weight to somebody we don't even know. But to a child, we still put weight in what they know, especially if others seem to validate it. And so it's just how malleable a child is, how easily influenced they are by the opinions of others. And it's only over time that those opinions of others become our opinions and settle in. And now you can say what you want, but if it doesn't agree with the opinion I have, I don't really care about what you say. That's not true for a child. But once that opinion is formed, if it's wrong, it's hard to change. And it can influence everything we do. And that's why the shame core belief that I must not be lovable, I must not be good enough, that's created by the mirrors of mom and dad saying, I'm neglecting you because you're not valuable. We then believe that's the truth. We, we can't see that it's because mom and dad got their issues and I'm just fine. We go, I must be a zero. And that affects how I approach relationships, that affects how I approach life, and it's really hard to change. How can, how can inconsistency affect a child? And what I mean by inconsistency, let's say that one day everything's all peaceful and loving, and then next week it's not, and it's the opposite. And then the other week it's nice, and it's, it's unpredictable. It can be almost like very anxiety-provoking. What, what effect does that environment have on, on children? Huge. So a child needs to be healthy. They need structure, routine, consistent boundaries in order to feel safe. They need to know that where the boundary is today, it's going to be tomorrow. And therefore, I know kind of what I can do, what I can't do, what to expect. It takes away the unknown. It takes away surprises. And it allows me to settle into this is a normal, safe routine where I don't get hurt and I can feel secure. And so security for a child is really based on being able to connect to mom and dad who are safe, but also having a safe routine and boundaries. If that's changing <laughs> and every day is different, some days are chaotic, some days are peaceful, I don't know what to expect on any given day. And I don't know if, if today's going to match tomorrow and, and whether there's going to be something hurtful tomorrow. So all of a sudden, my stress level goes up. I'm in the unknown all the time. I'm walking on eggshells and I'm hypervigilant because now what's going to happen? I, I have no way of predicting. And so a child needs to be able to predict that things will be a certain way. And if they can't, it adds to their stress level. Now, I'm guessing that also transfers to adulthood where you could almost constantly be looking for threats. You're constantly on edge. Um, is, that, is that safe to say how that, that anxiety from that inconsistency can transfer to being an adult as well? Yes. So with simple trauma, we end up with kind of PTSD, which is hypervigilance. Complex trauma, ongoing danger we end up with CPTSD, which is hypervigilance plus anxiety. Um, so now it's, I got to be on guard all the time because things are changing or could change. But now I got anxiety every day because I've never been able to resolve anything. And so most people that come out of complex trauma have anxiety issues because they've had all of this inconsistency for years that's created ongoing fear that they can't resolve and that ongoing fear is anxiety. Now, let's say someone is um, in that, like you worked, we talked about earlier, um, in that sympathetic nervous system all the time. What are ways that we can get to that parasympathetic nervous system? And unfortunately, I feel like uh, nowadays when people relax, they pull out their phone and they're on social media, right. Right. which which is not, in my, in my uh, assessment, is not really necessarily going to your parasympathetic nervous system. So what right. are ways that we can get to that parasympathetic? No, it's a wonderful point because a lot of people today, when they think of relaxing or self-care, actually are thinking of self-indulgence. And it's 
entertainment while they're still in their sympathetic. And that's not true self-care. So true self-care are things that help me get to my parasympathetic. And, and so there's two ways of coming at this that are important for people to understand. So there's top down and bottom up. So top down and bottom up refer to your brain. So your brain is a bottom up. It was first the brain stem was built, then on top of that was the limbic brain, and then on top of that is the cortex. So when we talk top down, we're talking about using your cortex, your thinking part of your brain, in order to regulate your emotional world, in order to help you relax and calm down. So, so for some people, that's meditation, that's telling themselves certain truths that are important for them to be reminded of, that's reading, that's doing mental activities that are self-soothing, that are healthy, that are important for them. Um, but bottom up is usually the more important way for people to learn to get to their parasympathetic. And so it's all that a baby has when a baby's dysregulated. What does a parent do to regulate it? So the parent connects to it and they have to be regulated themselves. So they got to be a calm parent and then they meet the child's needs, but then they soothe the child. And how do they soothe the child? They pat it on the back, they rock it, they sing to it, they bob it up and down, they do things that calm it. And so what, they have, what we have found is those are the very things bottom up that help us get to our parasympathetic. So breathing, so a deep breath. So if you look at a dog when it's been out playing and it's, it comes and sits down on the couch, it takes a, <gasps> and then it just falls asleep. Because it's that deep breath is putting it into its parasympathetic. So breathing, deep breathing is one of the best ways to get your parasympathetic. But then, why does rhythm work with a baby? Because when a baby is in the womb, the one sound and rhythm it hears is its mother's heartbeat, 60 to 80 beats a minute. And so when it connects to 60 to 80 beats a minute today, it feels safe again. And so rhythm is something that helps us relax and so music for some people walking different activities um, that are very rhythmic can all be very good then connection for some people that is pet therapy that kind of thing um, so there it's finding the things that are self-soothing so a hobby art music rhythm, walking, nature, all of those are bottom up. They calm the brain stem down. And that, therefore, takes you to your parasympathetic. Hmm. Now, when, when people hear that, they could go, but alcohol does the same thing. Uh, marijuana does the same thing. All these <laughs> drugs do the same thing. What, what is, um, what's the role of drugs and, and, and um, in all of this? Because that's a way that people um, self-soothe as well as an adult. Very much. Very much. So the challenge when you look at like alcohol, marijuana, is it brings external chemicals into the brain that, yes, they help calm the brain. And once in a while, that, that can be okay. But if you start bringing them in too much, too often, then the brain starts to adjust to them. Because it in his, its mind, it has its normal levels and you're not, you're messing up those more normal levels by bringing in these foreign chemicals constantly. So it adjusts, or we call it tolerance. So all of a sudden, what you used to drink to relax no longer works. Now you got to drink more. And then your brain adjusts to that. Then you got to drink even more. And, and it begins to have a reverse effect. And the same with marijuana. You, it calms you down, but your brain adjusts, and pretty soon it starts creating anxiety instead of stopping anxiety. So it's whenever you bring in a foreign chemical, it might be okay, like lorazepam or, or something like that, once in a while, but you do it too frequently, then the brain starts to change. And once the brain starts to change, then the law of diminishing returns. And it's tough because I feel like, like you said, the law of diminishing returns, um, it, you can almost 
when the, the feeling of being sober could be so miserable after doing yes. all those drugs that it could make you want to do more uh, exactly. to, to, to counter, to feel not normal, but to, to, to just get out of the misery of being sober. Right? Exactly. And that's why we say that for most people that use drugs initially, to them it wasn't a problem. It was a solution to their problem. And so for people, 97% of addicts have complex trauma. And when you look at complex trauma, you have unresolved needs, which means unresolved pain and negative emotions. So the child can't resolve all these negative emotions. Then they don't have the positive brain chemicals of serotonin, dopamine, oxytocin, endorphins that you get from connecting to healthy people. So all they have is basically negative emotions in their brain not being counteracted by these positive chemicals. Then they find drugs and alcohol and they go, oh, I found the solution. Because drugs and alcohol release dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and they give you fake chemical feelings of what you should have got from connecting and to safe, healthy people. And so for most people using drugs and alcohol, it becomes what they think is the solution to their problem. And so in order for them to kind of get past the drugs and alcohol and the need to use it, they have to build healthy connections. They have to learn to meet their needs in healthy ways so they get the good chemicals naturally. Otherwise, being sober is a drag. <laughs> it's, it's, it's empty. It's dead. And so that's why just a person quitting drugs and alcohol is a wonderful accomplishment in one sense, but it's not the real solution. And so we say the opposite of addiction is not sobriety. The opposite of addiction has to be connection. Because if you don't learn to connect to safe, healthy people, you still end up with all the dead, empty emotions inside and unresolved pain. So when it, when it comes to healing trauma, how important is it to um, reflect on it? Because, you know, the, um, that's what, that's what people do in therapy or um, people talk about it with their friends is they're almost talking about what happened and processing it. Is that a crucial step to healing? It is as long as it's not the only step. So uh, what's happened for a lot of people uh, is they like talking about their trauma, but they're doing it as a victim that never wants to leave being a victim. They always want to blame somebody. They want others to feel sorry for them. They want to feel sorry for themselves, but they don't want to take the steps to heal, to grow, to change. And so for them, self-talk or talking about it is actually just feeding, keeping them sick. But if a person is wanting to change, yes, then there's value in talking about it so you can reprocess it, so you can realize that wasn't my fault, that was my parents' issues, here's the tools I need to be healthy instead of these maladaptations I developed, and so then that leads to healthy growth and change. So it's a very important distinction that talking for the sake of talking helps nobody talking has to have a healthy purpose that leads to change. So what are those uh, steps afterwards that we should take to uh, heal um, after maybe we, we talk about it? Um, Cause like you said, that's not enough. What are, what are some practical things that we can do? So it's important to realize the, all the subconscious programming that developed as a child based on your adapting to survive. So you might have started to manipulate. You might have started becoming a control freak, a perfectionist, a people pleaser. You might have done all kinds of different things to try to not get hurt or get your needs met. Those are now maladaptations. So now you have to become aware of all of your unhealthy coping styles, the things that trigger that so that you can begin to not use the old set of tools, but develop a new set of tools that's actually healthy. Secondly, that core belief of shame that I'm, all this happened to me because I must not be lovable or good enough, it's really critical to start healing that. Because if a person doesn't heal that core belief, 
they're just going to keep going back to the behaviors of shame. Um, it, it's such a critical thing. The next one for, is so important is, so complex trauma danger keeps you in the limbic brain or the emotional part of the brain, um, the child brain, and that's all about instant protection, instant gratification. It doesn't think about long-term consequences. It doesn't think about what's healthy. It just thinks about surviving. But that, the longer the complex trauma went on, the more you just stayed in your limbic brain. So instead, the natural development for a child is you go from your limbic brain to your cortex. You go to thinking stuff through, thinking about what's healthy, thinking about consequences, and then doing stuff because it's right and healthy, not because you feel like it or not. Um, but complex trauma keeps you stuck in your child brain. And that often is very dysregulated. So you get angry, you just go all over the place. You get full of fear, you just go all over the place. So you go from zero to 100 in a nanosecond, and you go into all these unhealthy behaviors, unhealthy ways of thinking. And so it becomes important to develop the ability to regulate your emotions when you get into your limbic brain, to calm yourself down, to ground yourself. That becomes so important. Then the final thing I would say is awareness. So because of the complex trauma, you couldn't resolve anything, so you just shut down your emotions, you dissociated. I don't want to feel, I don't want to be aware of my internal world, it's too painful there, I'm just going to be busy, I'm just going to be all about activities and my image. Now you have to become aware of your internal world. What am I feeling today? Where's my anger at? Where's my fear at? Where's my anxiety at? Where's my depression at? I have to start becoming aware of how I tick internally, how I'm feeling internally, what my thinking is, what, what's a lie, what's a distortion, what's the truth. So that self-awareness is massive. It takes a lot of work to learn that. Um, so you got to couple that self-awareness with regulating your emotions, and those are tough tools to learn because when you're triggered, how do you stop the train once it's starting to leave the station? Like it, it, You just don't sometimes feel you have the energy. So learning that bottom-up regulation is so important. So those are just kind of getting you started um, principles for healing. You know, I feel like when the uh the our traumas come to the surface most is in intimate relationships yeah. what what about intimate relationships trigger us like nothing else i mean everyone can relate to this where yeah um intimate like if something goes wrong with the intimate relationship they can almost be out of body almost and act yeah. ways that they didn't know they could act what about what about in relationships can do that to us so uh, such an important thing complex trauma is basically trauma that takes place from relationships um and intimate relationships. So the most intimate relationship to an infant is mom and dad and siblings. And so the most intimate relationships that are to love you and that you're supposed to be able to trust are the ones neglecting you and hurting you and abandoning you. And so the deepest wounds come from the most intimate relationships. So what happens for a lot of people in recovery is they start recovery by learning information. And that's pretty safe. They can do that all by themselves. But then they, they start to build some relationships, but they're kind of casual friendships that they're, they're not too threatening. And so it doesn't trigger them too much. And so they think, wow, I'm really flying in this recovery thing. And then they get into an intimate relationship. <laughs> Why? Because their deepest wound is being are being triggered. Their fear of being abandoned, their fear of being hurt, their fear of being judged and rejected. All of those things all of a sudden kick in. Um, so if their spouse rolls their eyes a little bit, doesn't listen to them totally, contradicts them, talks behind their back, says something to a friend that breaks a confidence in their mind, bang, 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 okay, my childhood's happening all over again, this is not a safe place, and I got to go fight, flight, or freeze. Like this, I can't deal with this. And so it brings these intense, extreme reactions because the child's brain early on said, respond in extreme ways so that you never get hurt again, you never get abandoned again. And those kick in now, but it might be 40 years later. 
and you go, what's the connection? Well, it's your childhood. And so if you get into the brain, what you realize is that you might be, I often ask clients when they get triggered, how old do you feel right now? And they might be 50, 60 years old, and they go, I feel like I'm six years old. And I go, yes, because you just went back into the part of your limbic brain where that wound took place, and it got reactivated. And so you lost all track of time, and it's now like you're six years old, and it's happening all over again. So you're not separating the present from the past. It's all the same to you right now. And so that's what's so important is that the triggers take place in the limbic brain, but the brain pulls up the memory from a certain age group. And, and so intimate relationships are the strongest forms of triggers for people with complex trauma. I also feel like a lot of people, they, they crave that intimacy so much, but at the same time, they're terrified of it. Yes. And they can almost sabotage it as well. Where does that where does that sabotage come from? That self sabotage of um, subconsciously ruining a situation that's good for us. Um, where does that come from? A couple possible reasons, but just to give you a, a few. Um, so, what happened? We talked about kind of the inconsistency of the child growing up, and so it's what can happen for a lot of children is without them realizing it, life kind of follows a cycle. So, mom and dad are getting along. Then it's there in their honeymoon period. But then all of a sudden tension's building. But mom and dad aren't resolving it. Mom and dad aren't talking it through. It's just getting stuff, stuff, and the pressure builds and pressure builds until there's a big outburst. And there's everything hits the fan, and it's explosion. And then afterwards everybody feels sorry and is on their best behavior, and it's honeymoon period again. And so this cycle happens over and over. But what, what a child begins to realize is that when we're in the honeymoon period, don't get your hopes up because <laughs> it's going to get bad. The other shoe is going to drop. And so that can be number one. So now as soon as start, things start going good, something in the back of their brain goes, the other shoe is going to drop. Let's just sabotage it and get it over with. The other thing that can happen for children in complex trauma is children have this amazing ability to hope that their parents will love them. And so it's mom and dad aren't meeting my needs. But if I try this, maybe I do more chores, then maybe my dad will love me more. And so they get their hopes up that if I do more chores, dad's going to love me. Well, they do more chores, but dad doesn't love them. But instead of just accepting it's dad's problem, they go, it must be my fault. So maybe I'll do this. If I get better grades in school, then dad will love me. And they get their hopes up again. And so they keep getting their hopes up to get their hopes dashed repeatedly. So what's happening by the time they get, usually what we find, about 12 or 13, they begin to go, not only am I getting hurt, but my hopes are getting dashed. That's kind of get double whammy pain is happening to me now. So you know what? I'm going to stop getting my hopes up because I never get my hopes realized. So that's a safe way to live. Just shut down hope, never hope about anything again. That way you're not going to get hurt as badly. But you get into recovery and things start going well. You get your job back. You're, you're doing well. You get a relationship. And your hopes are starting to build that you might have a good life. And your brain goes, don't get your hopes up. Let's sabotage everything. It's easier to go back to what feels comfortable and normal, which is failure, nothing working out than it is to actually change. And it's tough too when you have, when you almost have evidence from the past that supports that. Like for me right now, I'm, when it comes to the podcast business wise, everything's up, but in the back, but in the past I've had moments where everything was good and it all came crashing down. So in the back of my mind, there's always that like, that fear of it all coming down. I wouldn't say I'm self-sabotaging it now because I'm past that point, but there's still that in the back of my mind being like, remember last time, a couple of years ago when everything was going great and it all fell down is, this is an interesting question. Is part of that almost healthy in a way to yeah. almost be like on edge and um, not get too comfortable? Is that, is that almost like a little bit of that good? Yeah, for sure. And if I could just expand on it, Brian, to a, a yeah, bigger yeah. picture. So a child tends to see things very black and white. So, when when and it should initially in childhood that 
if I'm authentic, people should want to connect with me, people should accept me. Um, and so if I'm authentic and people don't want to connect with me, then being authentic is bad. That's the only conclusion. And all the evidence supports that being authentic is bad. The only way people want to connect with you is if you're fake. And that then becomes kind of their mathematical equation that they live their life by. Um, and so what they don't factor in is authentic, uh, authenticity is good with safe people, but authenticity is good with bad, unsafe people. Um, but, so they don't qualify it. It's just all or nothing. Authenticity all the time, regardless of who it is. And since they only had unsafe people, authenticity is always bad. So now when they meet a safe person, I'm not going to be authentic because you'll reject me. So they're not able to make those qualifications. So that carries into all of life. So in your case, yes, there's times where Life is up and down. Life is hard. Life can fall apart. That's reality. But what can happen out of complex trauma is life fell apart constantly. So a good life to me should be life that's perfect and is easy and everything's smooth constantly. All or nothing. There's no qualifying it. There's no middle gray ground. That's the way the brain, their brain works in order to try to stay safe. And so part of growing is beginning to qualify stuff and go, hey, whoa, there's some qualifiers here that I need to factor in to think accurately about this. Yeah, and it's, I feel like it's, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's also just accepting the fact that this is going to happen. That's exactly. just like there's no, there's no avoiding that and there's no escaping that. Exactly. And so what comes out of complex trauma often is when life has been chaos and unmet needs and a lot of bad stuff happening, it's it's easy because you have no role models that are healthy. You don't have any normal that's healthy. You just have a, a normal that's quite unhealthy. It's very hard to figure out what a healthy normal looks like. And it's very easy to have unrealistic expectations about what a healthy normal should be. And so what happens for a lot of people coming out of complex trauma is they have all kinds of unrealistic expectations about life. And they set themselves up actually to fail, which is sad. Yeah, my, my favorite quote of all time is, is from Tony Robbins. Uh, and it's from, um, it's from one of his books. It's um, people, you could be winning, but feel like you're losing because a scorecard to grade your life could be unfair. And, you know, I feel like a lot of people right now have unfair scorecards and especially with social media and seeing all the other people that are doing so much better than them, their store, their scorecards are off the roof and it can almost be like these unrealistic expectations that we have. Right. Exactly. Exactly. And that's, I think it's a wonderful metaphor to use for people coming out of complex trauma is they have all the wrong scorecards in many, many areas. And, and so they're evaluating themselves, but they're always failing based on those scorecards. Yeah, and so one of the things we tell people when they're healing from complex trauma is you basically have to deconstruct your entire life to go what was healthy, what was unhealthy, what was I lied to, what was the wrong equation I built my life on, what was my wrong definition of success, of happiness. you got to deconstruct it all, not just to destroy it, but so you can reconstruct it with a healthy foundation, with a healthy belief system, with the healthy tools. And that's not a fun process, but it's a very necessary process. What do you, what do you think is the biggest misconception that young people have about being an adult? <laughs> that's a good question. Um, I think a lot of people in the, in the West um, think that being an adult means you're just going to be this rigid, routine bound person who works all the time, never has fun, and is super responsible. And I think part of that is uh, there's a play, a play institute in Chicago that to me has done some amazing work, but it basically is children need play. It's a big part of what helps them develop and build relationships and develop skills, figure out what they're good at, learn how to think. Like so many wonderful consequences come out of play and so we encourage children to play but it's like we think that once you hit 18 or go off to university well you got to grow up now no more play it's work 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 
what we found is adults need play just as much as children. Um, and so I think for a lot of children, they they resent or fear becoming an adult because they're going to lose the fun of life, the joy of life, that which makes life enriched. Um, anyways, to me, that's just one thing that that's a, a big part of a lot of children today. So to sum it all together, um, let's say there's someone right now in their 20s that is just now coping with uh, past traumas from their um, early teens and childhood. What's, what would you say would you be your, um, your biggest advice to them, uh, the, the biggest takeaways from this conversation that, that they should take to sum it all up? Yeah, I would say to me, somebody at that age is you really need like a surrogate mentor, surrogate parent to help you rethink life, to help you learn tools. Um, it's because you didn't get a good set of tools from your biological parents. You didn't get the right kind of thinking from your biological parents and beliefs. So you can't just figure it out on your own. You need, you need somebody who can help you begin to do that. And, and so that's where it might be very wise to take a course like our, our lift course, online lift course, where you're beginning to connect with other people taking the same journey. You have some mentors that help you begin to process through stuff to get you started on the right track, to get you pointed in the right direction with the right knowledge base and toolkit. So my last question is, if you had a minute with your younger self, what would you tell him if you had uh, one minute? Um, I think what I would want my younger self to learn is uh, the starting point is learning to meet my own 12 needs, to take care of me, to accept myself, to an enjoy myself to be authentic there was a big part of my childhood where i wasn't allowed i was allowed to be authentic in a lot of areas but not all areas um i was accepted in most areas but not all areas and so as i look back that's where a lot of the damage was done in my life and and so for me it's a lot of my needs were met but some of my key emotional needs weren't met and I would want my younger child to know it wasn't their fault and that I'm going to work hard to try and meet those needs now and learn how to do it in a healthy way.